Always think about the element e. Better. So it's the function that sort of, I don't know what you want to think of it as, some sort of trivial function that, regardless of what goes in, e comes out. Then sigma is a group homomorphism. Then sigma is a homomorphism. Homomorphism of groups. So I'm going to start abbreviating homomorphism just by HOM. Let's check that it is. It's not too bad to do. Let's see, take any two elements of G. So pick X and Y in G and compute each of the two expressions. If I compute phi of X, Y, well, folks, not phi, sorry, sigma. If I compute sigma of X, Y, what does sigma do? Sigma says, I don't care what I'm handed. I spit out E. That was easy, because I don't care what's in the window. It doesn't matter. E always comes out. But what's sigma of X, sigma of Y, E times E, which is E. So the two expressions are the same. We usually call this the trivial homomorphism. It's no big deal. All right. More examples. Some interesting ones here. Example. Uh, let G be this group, the group of invertible n by n matrices with entries from the reals. So what does this mean? It means n by n matrices, fixed n, n by n matrices with non-zero determinants. So that's a group. And here's what I want you to do. Pick any element in there, any, let's call it, I don't know, capital A in G. So A is some matrix. You've written it down. And it's not going to change throughout the discussion. Now we're going to write down a function. Define, I'm going to call it phi sub capital A. It's going to be a function from G to itself. And you're starting to maybe see that a lot of homomorphisms turn out to be homomorphisms from the group to itself. That certainly doesn't have to be the case as in the example from Sn to Z2, but it turns out to be an important case. This is going to be one of them. As follows, phi sub A of any element in the group, well, the group consists of matrices, so it's not unreasonable to call a generic element in the group M, equals A inverse MA. So regardless of what you throw into this function, what comes out is what you get when you multiply on the left by A inverse and what you multiply on the right by A. Okay. I mean, if you've got an element in the group, that means it's got non-zero determinant. Well, if you've picked something in the group, it's got non-zero determinant, so its inverse exists, it's got non-zero determinant, so all this stuff winds up back in G. So the fact that this is a function from G to G is not that big an issue, but it turns out to be homomorphism. Then V sub A is a homomorphism. Let's check it. Check. Let's see, why is that? We need to take any two things in the domain group. Well, in the general definition, I called those things X and Y, but you should call them whatever is representative of the things in the domain group. Here are their matrices. So let's call them, I don't know, M and M prime or something like that, or M and N. Let's do the computation. If I do the first computation, the first computation says, go ahead and combine the two things inside the group and then run the product through the function. Well, folks, here's what this function does. It takes whatever it's handed, it multiplies it on the left by A inverse and on the right by A. On the other hand, if I compute this expression, that's the second thing I need to compute. I need to take the function, run each of the individual group elements through it individually, and then combine. Well, let's see. The definition of this is you multiply on the left by A inverse. You take whatever's in the window, and you multiply on the right by A. Definition of this, you multiply on the left by A inverse. You multiply. Oh, and you see what's going to happen here. It's a trick that we've seen before. That is. The identity matrix, A inverse, M, identity, and A. Yeah, but if you multiply by the identity, it doesn't change anything. And so the two are equal. Equal. So we've got a homomorphism. All right. In fact, it turns out here, folks, that there's nothing really special. Megan, question? No? 
there's nothing really special about the fact that I happen to be working with matrices. In fact, you can define this sort of function from any group to itself. Take a group, pick your favorite element in the group, call it A, and define something called phi sub A from the group to itself simply by setting phi sub A of the element to be A inverse times M times A. Now, if we were to do this, but instead of picking GLNR, we were to pick something like the complex numbers under multiplication in a abelian group, then this sort of operation, I mean, if the group's abelian, then this just slides across that, and you get A inverse times A, you just get M. So a lot of times, this type of homomorphism turns out to just be the identity homomorphism. In fact, it's not too hard to show that if you pick something called A, and you can slide A past all the elements in the group, maybe if the group's a billion, or if you start with the identity element or something like that, then it turns out that this homomorphism might be sort of uninteresting. It might be one of these trivial homomorphisms, but in a situation like this, this turns out to be at least non-trivial, because what's coming out is not necessarily what, when is not necessarily the original matrix. Okay. All right, let's do some more. More examples. Example, uh, I'm going to hand you two groups, G1 and G2, and I'm going to ask you to form their direct product, so that gives me a group. So it makes sense to talk about a function from this group to other groups. Well, how about to G1? I can do the same thing with G2 in a minute. Here's the definition of the function. What I'm asking you to input are ordered pairs. In fact, yeah, all right. And what I'm going to ask you to spit out is just tell me what's in the first coordinate. Bless you. So all this is, folks, I mean, it's something that you're familiar with in linear algebra as well. It's simply the function that's typically called the projection function, the projection onto the first coordinate here. All you're doing is taking the function that picks off the first coordinate. Then phi is a homomorphism. In fact, let me call it phi sub 1 is a homomorphism. The 1, because what I'm asking you to do is, picking, is pick off whatever's in the first coordinate here. Reason, it's easy to do. In fact, I'll leave it to the reader here because it simply boils down to how you combine things inside the appropriate product. So I'll let you pound out the appropriate equation here. Let's look at another example of a homomorphism example. Uh, yeah. Oh yeah, let's do two more here. Um, if I look at so this is the collection of polynomials, polynomials, coefficients in R, and the operation is addition. So this is a group that we looked at once, way back when, when we were looking at a lot of examples of groups, but haven't really pulled this one back up yet. So the elements of this particular group are simply polynomials, you know, a0 plus a1x plus a2x squared, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and you simply add them together. It's no big deal. The zero polynomial is the identity element. If you have me a polynomial, just throw negative signs in front of all the coefficients, and you get the negative of it. Well, here's a function from this group to itself. Define phi from g to g. In fact, instead of calling it phi, let's call it something a little more suggestive. This is Greek letter delta, and the definition of delta is take delta of something in this group. Well, the things in that group are polynomials, so it's not unreasonable to call a polynomial that. And what I want it to spit out is the derivative of the polynomial. And that makes perfect sense. I know what the derivative of a polynomial is, and it's another polynomial. So at least I've got a function from <clears throat> polynomials to polynomials, and it turns out this particular function is a homomorphism. Reason? Let's see, what do we have to do? Show delta is a homomorphism. Greek letter delta, because this stands for derivatives, so it's the letter D here. So we have to pick two things inside the domain. You know, in general, we call them X and Y. Sometimes we call them M and N. Sometimes we call them G1. It doesn't matter. 
Here, let's call them little f and little f1 and little f2. How about delta of f1 of x plus f2 of x is you take the derivative of it. So it's the derivative of x. That's the definition of the function. Just take the derivative of whatever you've been handed. Yeah, but equals property of what? Calculus result. If you have two functions and you add them together and you take the derivative, it's the derivative of the first plus the derivative of the second. That's a one there that's prime. So you proved in your Calc 1 course that, I mean, it's just properties of derivatives here. But on the other hand, if I do delta of F1 plus delta of F2, that's exactly what I get, F1 prime of X plus F2 prime X. Check. So the point is that the derivative function is a homomorphism from the collection of polynomials to itself. And if you took linear algebra from me, that was a strong example that you saw all the time as an example of a linear transformation from a vector space to itself. It turns out that this thing happens to be a vector space with coefficients and reals. But all I'm worried about is the addition operation. The addition operation makes it into a group. Okay. All right. Final example before we move on and look at some properties of homomorphisms. And the final example is, oh, yeah, this one. Um, uh, let's call it uh, V from the group of non-zero complex numbers to the group of positive real numbers, both of these, of course, under multiplication. And the definition of the function V is take V of some complex number, and what I want you to spit out is the length of that complex number. I mean, it's absolute value if you want to think in terms of Pythagorean theorem or find that complex number in the complex plane and then just tell me how far it is from the origin. All right, so there's a function. Let's see, if I hand you a non-zero complex number, the length of a non-zero complex number is always a positive real number, so at least it lands inside this group. So the function is a legit one, and now the question is, can we show it's a group homomorphism? And it turns out to be, well, let's see, what's the function V of alpha beta is the length of alpha beta, which is property of complex numbers. Of complex numbers, that's the same as the length of alpha times the length of beta, because the length function preserves multiplication. But on the other hand, V of alpha times V of beta is length of beta, and we're done. The two are equal. Okay. So there's another example of a homomorphism. So there are homomorphisms everywhere. You've got to be careful, just because you write down a function, there's certainly no guarantee it's going to be a homomorphism, so I tried to keep you a little bit honest on Monday by giving you that example. I mean, here's a perfectly good way of getting from the integers to the integers, just add 4 to everything, sort of shifting by 4, and it turns out that's not a homomorphism. We gave a specific counterexample to show that. What we're about to do, and folks, this is what you always do. When you write down a new sort of structure, the typical game plan is, Write down a bunch of examples of that structure. We've done a bunch of examples of homomorphisms. Then show that if you somehow know that you've got one of these things, what necessarily follows? Okay, what's necessarily true about those things? Just like we do with groups. We wrote down what a group was, and then we wrote down a bunch of properties that groups necessarily have to have. We wrote down subgroups. We wrote down properties that subgroups necessarily have to have, like Lagrange's theorem or something. Now we've written down a new notion, homomorphism. So we've written down a bunch of examples. Here are some properties. So here are some properties of homomorphisms. Of homomorphisms. So the hypothesis is proposition assume that you've got a homomorphism from a group to a group. Be a homomorphism. A homomorphism. Then here's the first thing that's true. Here's the first thing that's true. This property isn't given in the definition. 
But it turns out, if you can convince me that you've got a homomorphism, then necessarily the following properties have to hold. If, for example, you choose to plug in the identity element of the group here, what you get out is the identity element of the range group. So I don't think I need to write out what this notation means. E is the identity element of G. E prime is the identity element of G prime. It turns out if you have a homomorphism, necessarily the identity element of G has to land on the identity element of G prime. Oh, here's another thing that's true about homomorphisms. For each element in the group, let's call it A, A in G, if you throw in the inverse of A into the homomorphism, in fact, what you get out is if you had thrown in A into the homomorphism, written down whatever the output is over in G prime, and then told me what its inverse is. So the verbiage is homomorphisms preserve identity elements and homomorphisms preserve inverses. That shouldn't be surprising because homomorphisms preserve the group structures. That's the sort of philosophy or the intuition behind what a homomorphism does. Again, this isn't part of the definition, and it's not something that we just hope to be the case. In fact, it's something that we'll be able to prove is true. All right. So let's prove these. Proof. Hmm. Well, I'm gonna haul. I'm gonna haul something out for you. Uh, this is a good one. Remember, you proved for homework the following property, that if you hand me a group, there's exactly one element in the group that is what's called idempotent. There's exactly one element in each group with the property that when you combine it with itself, you get itself back. As we saw in the exam, if you're not in a group structure, there might be more than one. As we saw in the exam, if you're in a group structure, there is only one that came from a homework problem. So we know that to be true because we proved it for homework problems. So I'm going to use that property of groups. So folks, if I want to convince you that this is E prime, well, this is an element of that group, just because phi is a function from G to G prime. So this is an element of G prime. If I can convince you that this is an idempotent element of G prime, folks, there's only one idempotent element in G prime. It's the identity of G prime. In other words, it's E prime. So we use an old homework problem. Old homework problem. Problem. The result of which says there is only one element in G prime having the property that when you combine it with itself, I'll call it A star A equals A, it's E prime. So the point is, so if we can show that this particular element, phi of E, combined with itself, is itself, in other words, if I can show that this specific element of G prime has the property that when you combine it with itself, you get it, itself back, then we can conclude, can conclude that phi of E is the identity element of G prime. So it's nice, we did some work for homework that we can now use here in a really nice way. And this is easy to do, easy. So I'm going to show you this. Let's see, phi of E, star with phi of E, and maybe I should be a little more, I mean this is the, the star prime operation, but I'm already getting a little bit sloppy on the notation is what? Wait a minute, phi is a homomorphism, so if you take phi of something, star with phi of something else, it's phi of, because phi is a homomorphism, you might say, well, you've written it down backwards. Folks, it's an equation. I don't care whether you write this equals this or this equals this, it's the same information. Here we're sort of starting from the right-hand side and trading it in for the left-hand side, that's fine. Oh, but wait a minute, what's E star E? E star E is just E. Check. That was easy. 
So I've just shown that phi of e star phi of e is phi of e. So the conclusion is that phi of e is e prime. Okay. Property two. Same idea. Let's see, how do you show that something is the inverse of something else? You convince me that if you combine the two, you get the identity element of whatever group it sits in. So here's all we need to do. We need only show the following is true, that if we take this thing, phi of A inverse, and we combine it with phi of A, that we get the identity element of the group in which these things live. Here is a thing. I'm going to claim that it's the inverse of that. Yeah, being the inverse of something means that when you combine it with the other thing, that you get the identity. Let's see if it happens. But that's easy to do. Phi of A inverse, star phi of A. Oh, phi is a homomorphism. That's phi of A inverse star A, which is what? Phi of E which is, well, we just proved what phi of E is. We just proved in part one. If you drop the identity element of the group G into this function phi, and phi is a homomorphism, that E prime comes out. Check. So we're done with that one, too. So these homomorphisms really do, as advertised, they somehow preserve much of the group structure that's involved. The identity elements have to go where they need to. The appropriate... Uh, yeah. The appropriate uh, inverses go where they need to. Uh, quick observation. What we've just shown is that if you have a homomorphism, then necessarily it takes the identity element of the domain group to the identity element of the output group. So here's a quick proof that the function that I wrote down on Monday, the function from the integers to the integers that sent phi of z equal to z plus 4, in other words, the add 4, function can't be a homomorphism. Because what happens to zero? Zero, if you add four to it, goes to four. So it can't be a homomorphism because every homomorphism has the property that if you throw in the identity element, that the identity element has to come out. All right, so we get some sort of easy check marks. Yep, that particular map can't be a homomorphism. Okay. All right. So here's some properties. Now, just as when you looked at linear transformations in your linear algebra course, oops, um, you talked about various subspaces of the input space or the output space. You talked about the kernel of the linear transformation. You talked about the range of linear transformation. If the linear transformation happened to be a matrix multiplication, that boiled down to looking at row spaces or column spaces or something like that. It turns out similar quantities are around in the more general context of group homomorphisms. Homomorphisms from one group to another. You can talk about, well, let's see, what is the kernel of a linear transformation? It's the collection of things in the input space that wind up going to zero in the output space. That's what the kernel is. Well, we're going to talk about the same sort of idea here. And it turns out we can talk about the range of linear transformation. So, uh, if uh, phi from g to g prime is, again, a homomorphism, then we make the following definitions. Define the kernel of phi and here it is. The kernel of phi, here's the notation for it, k-e-r phi, sometimes we use the parens and sometimes we don't. It's the, intuitively, it's the collection of things that you put in that wind up going to the identity element when they come out. So it's the collection of elements in the input group with the property that when you run the thing through the function, that what comes out is the identity element of the output group. Hmm. Let's do a bunch of examples. Uh, no. Yeah, let's do examples first, and then we'll look at some properties. Example. 
Well, we can run through some of them. Like, uh, how about the function that we wrote down, sigma from Sn to Z2, the one we looked at last time. This was, you know, sigma, what do we call this one? Phi? I forget. Yeah, I guess we called it phi, sorry. Phi of sigma is, it's the parity function. It's the zero if sigma is even, and one if sigma is odd. So the question is, what's the kernel of this homomorphism? Well, the kernel by definition is the collection of things inside the domain. So it's a subset of the domain. It's those things that have the property that when you run them through the function, that the identity element of the range or the codomain or the target group gets spit out. So the question that we're asking is, what are the inputs that have the property that, well, let's see, the identity element over here is zero. So what are the things that spit out zero? Answer, the even ones. So the things inside here that get mapped to zero are precisely the even permutations, and we had a name for that subset. It was called A sub n. So here the kernel of phi is the even permutations, which just coincidentally happens to be given a name. And as we'll see, not so coincidentally, not only is it a subset of G, this one happens to be a subgroup of G. Let's do another example. Uh, how about, yeah, let's do this one. Oh, yeah, um, this thing that we call delta from R bracket X to itself, the derivative function turned out to be a homomorphism. What's its kernel? It's the collection of things in here that have the property that when you run them through this function, that zero comes out. So I'll rephrase that. It's the co collection of things in here with the property that the derivative is zero. Well, what polynomials have derivative equal to zero? The constant functions is the constant polynomials. These are the only polynomials that have. Derivative equal to zero. Hmm. All right, that's sort of an interesting example. Let's try one more uh, example. This one, what do I call it? V from the non zero complex numbers to the positive real numbers. Again, both groups having operation multiplication. V was the length function. Question, what's the kernel of V? It's the same question you're asking every time. If you want the kernel, you simply look inside here and you ask which things in the domain spit out or get taken to the identity function in the range. So the first thing you want to do is identify what the identity element in the range is. Well, remember, this group is under multiplication. So the identity element over here is 1, because the operation is multiplication. So the question we're asking is, what complex numbers have the property that their length is 1? And the answer is, those are simply the complex numbers that sit on the unit circle, the things that are length 1 away from the origin. So kernel of V is what we call the unit circle. If you want to draw these as complex numbers, if this is the complex plane, then the kernel looks like those things that are one unit away from the origin, or length one from the origin. So there's a picture of the kernel, the length one. All right. And we can write down the kernel for other examples. I mean, sometimes it's the case, folks, that the kernel is just zero. So let's do one more example of a situation where we've got a homomorphism and the kernel is just, well, an example. Let's see. The homomorphism that we looked at last time, uh, phi from z to z, the multiplication by 4 homomorphism, phi of z equals 4 times z. You know, the 
observation at the beginning of tonight was nothing special about four, just do it. What's the kernel of phi? Well, same question that you ask every time. What things in here spit out the identity element here? Well, identify the identity element over here. Zero. So the question is, what things here spit out zero? What things here have the property that when you multiply them by four, you get zero? Just zero. That's the only thing that has the property that when you multiply it by four, zero gets kicked out. So it's possible, let's see, it's possible that the kernel of a homomorphism is just, well, it's just one element, is zero. Now make an observation and then we'll write down a proposition that you all know how to attack. We'll probably prove it because it's important enough in here for what we're going to do later on. But note, let's see, I have a property of homomorphisms. It's the property that I just erased, property one. We know that phi of E is E prime for any homomorphism, for any homomorphism phi. That was property one of the proposition. Wait a minute, what's the kernel of homomorphism? The kernel of a homomorphism is the things that you plug in that spit out E prime. Well, folks, it's always the case that if I plug in E, that E prime gets spit out. That's what we proved in proposition one. So it's always the case. So in particular, we always have kernel of phi. Anytime we have a homomorphism. So there's always something in there, the identity element. Proposition. Phi from G to G prime, a homomorphism. And folks, when I make this statement, of course, there's lots of other window dressing I could put in, but we don't need to do that. As soon as I tell you I've got a homomorphism, this automatically implies that the two things I'm looking at are groups with whatever operation you've got. It also doesn't preclude the possibility that G prime is G, but that's all right. Then the punchline is this. Then, let's see, the kernel of phi... Well, the kernel of phi is a subset of G. In fact, not surprisingly, is a subgroup of G. Mm -hmm. The kernel of any homomorphism from G to any other group you want, I don't care what G prime is, you always get a subgroup, the original group. Mm -hmm. Guess how we prove this? Subgroup theorem, exactly right. Okay. Huh. Theorem. In fact, let's knock through all three steps quickly. Step one, subgroup theorem. Pick two things in the subset. Show that the corresponding binary operation on those things is in the subset. So pick x and y in the kernel of phi. Show that x, y is in the kernel of phi. All right, so we can all do that in our sleep now. Let's see what that boils down to in this particular situation. The definition of kernel of phi means, what does it mean to say that x is in the kernel of phi? It means that phi of x is e prime. All I've done is rephrased what this inclusion means by definition. And phi of y is also e prime. That's what it means to be in the kernel. What do we have to do? We have to show that this thing is in the kernel. What does it mean to be in the kernel? It means if you drop it into the function that E prime comes out. So we have to show that if you drop that thing into the function, that E prime comes out. That's the task. And hopefully you see what's going to happen here. Well, but phi of xy is what? Phi is a homomorphism, folks. So if you have phi of, then you get phi of x, phi of y. And as promised, the notation has gotten a little bit sloppy, but we're familiar enough with it or comfortable enough with it. Technically, this should be x star y. That's the operation going on in G. Technically, this should be star prime because this is the operation happening inside G prime. But as soon as we know where everything is, it's understood what the operation is. So I don't have to keep putting in the stars and the star primes. Oh, but now we're in good shape. Phi of x is e prime and phi of y is e prime and e prime star e prime is e prime. Check. That was easy. 
And just in the interest of time, I'll wrap things up and say, well, you have to show the identity elements in there. Done. There it is. Check. You have to show that the inverse of any element in there is in there. And I'm not going to prove it for you, but I'll let you think about it at home. 3 follows directly from, from property 2 of the proposition that we proved above of the previous proposition. And I'll let you prove that. How does that follow? Well, think about it. Part 2 of the previous proposition says that if you take the inverse of an element and you run it through the homomorphism, you get the inverse of what would have come out. So if you take something such that phi of a is e prime, and you want to prove that phi of a inverse is also e prime, well, phi of a inverse is phi of a inverse, but phi of a is e prime, so it's the inverse of e prime, but the inverse of the identity is just the identity. And that's what's going on. All right, so we get a subgroup. And this subgroup is not just any old garden variety subgroup. These types of subgroups will play an unbelievably important role when we try to build a new type of group based on what's going on inside subgroups. Okay. So you might think, well, these are pretty, what's a good property? These are pretty ubiquitous, that's a good word. These should be everywhere because these subgroups are allowed to be the kernels for any homomorphism that you want. So start with any homomorphism. The kernel is always a subgroup. But it turns out the kernels of homomorphisms are actually very special kinds of subgroups. Okay? The first thing we're going to show about kernels is that they can determine whether or not the homomorphism is a one-to-one -one function which is a pretty surprising result. And the second thing we're going to determine or show about kernels is that kernels have a very special property that if you have a subgroup that happens to be the kernel of a homomorphism, then necessarily F, every left coset of such a subgroup is also a right coset of such a subgroup. And in the homework that you turned in tonight, you wrote down examples of subgroups in other groups that didn't have that property. So the kernels of homomorphisms will, in sort of a, a, an overall sense, be important because they have this property. Now, if you're thinking, well, why is that property important? That's a great question to ask, and we will see the answer to that by the middle of next Monday. Okay. Uh, properties. Uh, kernels of homomorphisms have some really nice properties. Nice properties. Okay. Here's the first one. Uh, proposition, and let me call this the proposition in its own right. Proposition. Um, the kernel of a homomorphism determines whether or not or not the function is one to one. Here's the specific statement. Specifically, the only time a function viewed as a group homomorphism is one to one is when the kernel is exactly this subgroup, if and only if phi is a one-to-one -one function. Okay, if and only if here. Hmm. So if you've got a group homomorphism, and if it's the case that the kernel of the group homomorphism is just the identity element of the group, I mean, it always has to contain at least the identity element of the group because the kernel is a subgroup. The point is, if that's the only thing in the kernel, then necessarily phi as a function is one-to-one. -one. And conversely, if phi is one-to-one, -one, then that's the only thing in the kernel. And this will be a really nice property to have around. It'll allow you to determine when it's the case that a function is one-to-one -one just by examining, well, the things that spit out the identity element of the target group. Here's the proof. It's not too bad. So we'll do the, the harder direction first.
So what do we want to do? We want to show that if phi of x is phi of y, then x equals y. That's what it means for a function to be one to one. Okay. That's the definition of being a one to one function. If you hand me any two inputs, if they kicked out the same output, then in fact they were the same input to begin with. Okay. But let's see. I'm starting with this equation, v of x equals v of y. v of x is v of y. That's the given information. I eventually want to conclude that x is y. But folks, this isn't just happening in arbitrary sets. This is happening inside some sort of group. So the hypothesis, and I should probably have written this out again, the standing hypothesis in all that we do tonight is this, that v from g to g prime is a homomorphism. So I'll let me just write that down here just so that we're talking the same language. Is a homomorphism. All right, so all this is happening inside G prime. This is a group element, that's a group element. So what I can choose to do is multiply, quote unquote, both sides by the inverse of either one of these. It doesn't really matter. I'm going to choose to multiply by the inverse of this. So phi of x combined with phi of y inverse equals v of y combined with v of y inverse. So I've simply chosen, because I can pull any element out of the group g prime I want, I've chosen to combine each side of this equation by the specific element v of y inverse. Now the reason I want to do that is the following. First of all, this is just an element combined with its inverse. So it is not an issue or any sort of property of homomorphisms that allows me to simplify this expression as just the identity element of the group that all this is happening in, which happens to be called E prime. So that's a non-issue. What is of interest though is, let's see, we prove property to that proposition that if you have the inverse, a phi of something, then that's the same as this. So this is use property two of the proposition. The inverse of phi of something is phi of the inverse of that thing. Oh, but wait a minute. This is phi of something combined with phi of something else. So since phi is a homomorphism, this is the same as phi of xy inverse. Phi of one thing combined with phi of another is phi of Combine the two things within the parens here. Yep, is E prime, sorry. All right, anybody want to tell me what the next step should be? What does this equation tell me? Yeah, only E goes to E prime. Right? The hypothesis is that the kernel of phi is E. And the point is that this equation tells me, by definition, let me write in one more line, this says that x, y inverse is in the kernel of phi. Because x, y inverse, when you run it through the function, spits out e prime. But the kernel of phi consists of just one element. There it is. So by hypothesis, hypothesis, this is sort of nice. X, Y inverse is E. Again, the hypothesis is that the only thing in the kernel is E itself. Well, I've just identified something that's in the kernel, so the conclusion is it has to be the one thing that I know is in there. And now simply multiply both sides on the right by Y. So X, Y inverse Y is E, Y. These then become E, so we get X is Y, and we're done. That's really nice. Okay. So if the kernel is just the identity, then phi is a one-to-one -one function. And the converse, I won't spend too much time proving, because the converse, folks, is really just a statement about functions. It's not a statement about group homomorphisms at all. If the function's one-to-one, -one, is it the case that the kernel of phi is just the identity? Yeah, because you can't have two different things going to the same element. Phi of E is E prime. Could you have phi of something else being E prime? No, because the function's one to one. So 
follows just from properties from the definition of being a one-to-one function. Okay. So this is a nice property of kernels. Kernels of homomorphisms determine or dictate whether or not the function that you've got your hands on is actually a one-to-one function or not. So, for example, the function from z to z that you get by multiplying by 4 is a one-to-one -one function. All right, second important property of kernels. Turns out to be the property that I just mentioned. Uh, here is, here is arguably the most important property, most important property of kernels. So here's the idea. I'm going to call this a theorem. Now I'll just call it a proposition. Proposition says this. So the hypothesis standing all day is that phi is a group homomorphism, a homomorphism. So that means G and G prime are groups. Phi is a function from G to G prime that satisfies the requisite property. G might be G prime, doesn't matter. What I want you to do is look at the following subgroup. Let capital K denote kernel of phi. So I'm going to put in parentheses, so K is a subgroup of G. That's what we just proved in this proposition by the subgroup theorem. I want you to look at this subgroup. Then the punchline is this. Then every left coset of K is also a right coset of K. In other words, if you've written down a subgroup and that subgroup happens to be the kernel of a homomorphism from the group G to any other group, I don't care what G prime is at all, the role of G prime is completely irrelevant here. But if you've written down a subgroup that can be viewed as the kernel of some group homomorphism, if you go ahead and you write down all of the left cosets of that subgroup, and then you go back and you write down all the right cosets of that subgroup, it turns out the two sets that you'll be looking at are identical. Hmm. Now remember, in class, we gave a couple of examples of subgroups where when you look at the left cosets, and then you go ahead and look at the right cosets, that you're not looking at the same subsets. So this property definitely does not hold for any arbitrary subgroup of a group, but this property does hold for subgroups that happen to come up or arise as kernels of homomorphisms. All right. Any suggestions on how I might prove this? Proof? Hmm. I'll give you a hint. Let's see, you did a problem for homework that said what? That if you have a subgroup, and the subgroup has the property that, let's see, what, what were the letters that were used in the, in the problem? With the property that G inverse HG is back in the subgroup, then you can conclude that the subgroup has the property that every left coset is a right coset. So if this is the conclusion I want to draw, then I can do so simply by showing you that this subgroup has the property indicated in the homework problem. What was that, problem 28 or something like that? Okay, so here's the proof. We use problem 28 in section what? Ten. Section 10. And that's exactly why problem 28, section 10 was assigned. Let's see. We show that the subgroup K has the property that for every element in the group, let's call it little g in capital G, and every, let's call it little k in capital K, that if we compute g inverse kg, that we get something back in K. 
because we proved in problem 28 of section 10 that if the subgroup that you've got your hands on has this property, then you can conclude that the subgroup that you have your hands on has the property that every left coset's a right coset. Hmm. And it turns out this property is going to be relatively easy to prove knowing that K is the kernel of a homomorphism. Here's how you do it. Well, let's see. Hmm. So what have I done? I pick any G in the group. I pick any K in the subgroup. Well, remember what the subgroup is. It's the kernel of phi. So we're assuming that K is in K. So what does that mean? I.e. that phi of K is the identity element in G prime. That's what it means to be in the kernel. It means if you run the element through the function that the identity element of the target group comes out. And what do we have to do? We have to show, well, the goal is to show that this element is in K. But what does it mean to be in K? It means that when you run it through phi, that the identity is supposed to come out. We have to show that if we run G inverse KG through the function, that the identity comes out. Because that's what it means to be in K, because K by definition is the kernel of phi. Can we do it? Not too bad. What is phi of G inverse KG? Well, phi is a homomorphism. So anytime you have phi of the product of two things, you can split it up. So this is, I could do it all in one step, but I'll go ahead and do it in two steps for you. So I'm asking you to combine that with that. So think there's a little dot in there. Yeah, there's also a dot there, but for now, just think of it as that, star that. So it's phi of the first thing, star phi of the second thing. Because phi is a homomorphism. And now I'm going to use the fact that phi is a homomorphism again. That's phi of G inverse, but what's this? It's phi of something combined with something else, so it's phi of the second one, phi of the third one. And again, the notation is a little bit sloppy because technically this is all happening in G prime, so there should be star primes here and star primes, but we know where this is happening because it's the image of phi, so necessarily this thing lives in G prime. Now for what it's worth, folks, in the future, you don't need to do two intermediate steps. If you have the product of three or more things inside the window here, and phi is a homomorphism, it breaks up over as many pieces as you want. So, I mean, this is sort of a proof by induction, and that's the first step of it, but I'll let you use that in the future. All right, so what? Well, here's the so what. We know something about this. T prime. So I just substitute because that's what I know about V of K. Well, that's totally convenient because now I'm multiplying by E prime. So that's not going to change anything. So that's V of G inverse, V of G. Which is what? Well, that's, I mean, there's a couple of ways I could do this. Let's just go ahead and use property two of the proposition. That's phi of g inverse phi of g, because that's what the proposition says. If you run the inverse of a function or of an element through the function and you get the, uh, what, what you would have gotten if you ran the original element through and then taken its inverse. Yeah, so then I got something inverse times the thing, which is e prime. Check. So here's what we've just done. We've started with a subgroup that happens to be the kernel of a homomorphism. And we've just shown that if you take any element in the group and any element in that subgroup and you compute or you combine or you perform the expression G inverse KG, that the result's not only always back in the group, but in fact is back in the subgroup. And once we have that property established for this subgroup, then the result of problem 28 in section 10 says, therefore, every left coset is a right coset. So conclude by the problem 28, section 10, number 28, that every left coset of K is also a right coset. So that's sort of interesting. Okay.
But yeah, I got 10 minutes. So I'm going to free associate for 10 minutes. That's good. At this stage, you're thinking, well, so what? Why do I care at all about this property that every left coset is a right coset? A great question. And here is a glimpse towards the future. Here's what we're going to do with, first of all, that particular property. One thing we'll be able to say is that there's some symmetry here. If you start with the kernel of a homomorphism, then every left coset is a right coset. The converse will be true as well. If you happen to have a subgroup, and the subgroup happens to have the property that every left coset is a right coset, then necessarily that subgroup is the kernel of some homomorphism from the group to some other group. Okay? That'll wind up being sort of the, the cherry on top of the, the Sunday that we'll get to about two weeks from now. So it turns out that that sort of connection between left cosets being right cosets and being kernels of homomorphisms turns out to be a very tight relationship. But what will be of significantly more interest to us surrounding this property of every left coset being a right coset is the following. Okay. What we're going to do starting Monday is we're going to start building new groups. Well, we've done that before. We built groups out of matrices and out of functions and out of permutations and out of thises and thats. The way we're going to build these new types of groups is as follows. We're going to take a group, something that we know to be a group. We're going to write down whatever subgroup you want. Tell me which one it is. That's fine. Call it H. And the new group that we're going to form is going to have as its elements subsets of the original group. Seems a little bit weird. We say that again. The elements of this new group that we're going to form, the elements each are going to be subsets. So what we're eventually going to teach you how to do is take a subset of the group and combine it with another subset of the group to get yet another subset of the group. So we're going to have a binary operation on the collection of certain subsets of the group that's going to turn this collection of subsets into a group in its own right. Now I'm not just going to ask you to sort of willy-nilly pick whatever subsets you want to do this. The way you're going to choose or write down those subsets is you're going to take the subgroup that I've handed you and you're going to list out all of its left cosets. You know, I, just, I don't know, I have a warm place in my heart for things on the left. And I say that sort of facetiously because if you say, well, what if we did things on the right? Well, the point's going to be this, folks. The situations that are going to be of most interest are subgroups with the property that every left coset is a right coset. So if instead you had said, well, I wanted to choose all of the right cosets, you and I would be at least talking the same language here. Now, what I'm going to ask you to do is come up with a way of taking two cosets and producing from them another coset. Because the overall goal is to somehow construct a binary operation where the things in the set happen to be sets in their own right, happen to be cosets of this subgroup. Now the surface, well actually there's, there's maybe more than one way of thinking how you might do that. If I hand you a coset, maybe it looks like AH, and I hand you another left coset, maybe it looks like BH, and I ask you to combine those two cosets to produce another coset, how might you do that? Well, here's one possible way. I mean, this is just a, a collection of things in the group, and this is just a collection of things in the group. They're both just subsets. So one way to produce another subset of the group is just, you know, multiply everything in sight. Multiply everything in here times everything in here. So do that times that, and that times that, and that times that, and that times that. You know, just do all the possible combinations. Well, there's a reasonably good way of combining all the things in here with all the things in here. The problem with that, though, is that in general, what you get when you do that operation or that process might not be another coset. That's too bad, because if you're trying to describe a binary operation on the collection of cosets, you want it to be the case that when you take two cosets and combine them, you get another coset. If you do it in the manner that you might think is the most natural one, just sort of combine everything in here with everything in here, you might not get another coset. 
too bad. All right, well, let me give you another possible way of trying to describe a binary operation on the collection of cosets. If this one's called AH and this one's called BH, here's a way of combining those to get another coset. Write down the coset ABH. Just combine the two elements that are producing the cosets and say, all right, there's the coset I want you to spit out. That's a good idea, too. It's just the issue is, and this is where we're going to wind up going back to the stuff we talked about in days one and two in here. The issue is that that binary operation might not be, what, well-defined. might not be well-defined. Because the issue with cosets is there's lots of different ways of describing the same coset. There's lots of different names for the same coset. So here's the big picture of where we're headed, and we'll start doing all the details on Monday. Big picture of why this is important. of why the property every left coset is a right coset is important. Is important. Take any group G and any subgroup H and G. So I don't care what group you start with and I don't care what subgroup you start with. Then this set, the collection of left cosets is a set. Is a set. Just list them all out. In fact, I can tell you how many there are. If you start with a finite group and you tell me how big the subgroup is, the number of left cosets is this number that we call the index. If you hand me, for instance, a group with eight elements and a subgroup with two elements, then I'll tell you how many left cosets there are. There's eight divided by two or four of them. Write them down. Now, here's what I'm going to ask you to do. We attempt or we seek or we hope to define a binary operation on this collection. on the collection of cosets and that already seems weird. I'm going to teach you how to take two left cosets and combine them to produce another left coset. And once it's all said and done, once I teach you how to do that, the collection of left cosets is going to wind up being a group. It's just we have to get this process off the ground. And it turns out that turns out there are at least two, at least two, but I'm going to focus on two, possible ways of doing this, natural ways to do this, ways to do this. But in either of these ways, but to make these work, make these work, we need this property. The every left coset is a right coset property. Every left coset is a right coset property. In fact, let me modify this slightly and then we'll get out of here. There are two possible natural ways to try to do this. There are two natural ways of trying to define a binary operation on the set of left cosets. And I just described them in words and I will write out the details of those two possibilities on Monday. The first is just multiply everything in sight. The second is define something like AH combined with BH to be ABH. It turns out that if you don't have this property, there are issues with both of those things. But if you do have this property on the subgroup, then both of those ways will give you a perfectly good binary operation on the collection of left cosets. And not only that, 
they actually give the same binary operation. And not only that, once you've got the binary operation defined in either of those ways, then in fact you wind up getting a group. All right. Boom. That's